This program was made possible by the Florida Humanities Council. We come from all over, and we become one state, where we share in the history and become part of the culture that is Florida. The Florida Humanities Council, bringing Floridians together by sharing the stories of our state. And by the National Endowment for the Humanities, Merrill Stevens, founded in Florida in 1885, and today serving the growing global yachting community. The first European to set eyes on the Miami River was Juan Ponce de Leon. The year was 1513. And almost 500 years later, for most Miamians, the five and a half miles of waterway slicing through the core of the city remains undiscovered. But the Miami River has been, and continues to be, the living conduit through which the city nourishes itself. Its currents have carried pioneers upstream to explore, conquer the Everglades, and build Miami. Its waters have floated the canoes of Seminole warriors and the rickety craft of Cuban refugees. The river has harbored Miami's fishing, shrimp, and sponge fleets. The freighters that heave to along its banks have helped build Miami's international commerce. Its coal black waters have floated generations of kids on Huckleberry Finn adventures and launched secret CIA operations and drug smuggling boats. But the Miami River is more than a portal to a dim past. It is a vibrant present day mirror of the city. Reflected in its tea-colored water are the outlines of a newly born village of a few hundred white settlers and Seminole Indians, and the contours of a future international metropolis. This is the story of a working river, the people who struggled to build Miami, and the legacy in commerce, concrete, and glass that they made possible. It is 2,000 years ago. Tropical rains are falling onto a grassy savanna that will, in two millennia, be known as the Everglades. The rains will pool and collect, forming rivulets, and the rivulets forming streams. The streams will combine to become a quiet current towards the bay. A cargo ship on its way to an upriver port offers a view of both a geographical journey and a voyage back in time. If Miami had a birthplace, it would be here along the mouth of the river on what today is a tiny parcel of undeveloped land, literally choked by high rises and construction cranes. Just east of the Brickell Avenue Bridge, near the mouth of the river, is the Miami Circle Archaeological Site. In 1999, Robert Carr and a team of archaeologists uncovered the circle and evidence suggesting that an Indian village existed on this point of land more than 2,000 years ago. The Tecesta Indians were the indigenous people of southeastern Florida. They were here before the Seminoles, before the Miccosukee, before the uh, white pioneers and the African-Americans. The mouth of the Miami River was the prime 
location for their habitation. The word Miami is a Tequesta Indian term meaning sweet water. Along the banks of this sweet water, the early Tequesta would unknowingly anchor a thriving modern metropolis. It is precisely on this location that thousands of years later, Miami reinvents itself. By the late 1800s, railroads had pushed back America's frontier, and a railroad man named Henry Flagler would usher in the dawn of a new city on the banks of the Miami River. Author Don Gaby has chronicled the river's history. The turning point in the modern history of Miami is when the railroad arrives, because it made it possible to bring down, you know, large quantities of supplies and people and so forth uh, to begin building a city. Today, the sleek metro rail crosses the river and traces the same footprint left behind by the original Flagler Railway. Across the river from the Miami Circle, in the midst of downtown skyscrapers, we find the footprint of Flagler's Royal Palm Hotel. In 2004, on the construction site for another glass monolith, archaeologists scoured the remains of the once grand hotel in a search for hidden clues to Miami's past. What had been there were a number of very important prehistoric sites, including several mounds, a very large burial mound that was destroyed in the process of the construction of the hotel. So unfortunately, the De Casta legacy at that time was intensely disrespected and disregarded, but that kind of disregard was not unusual a hundred years ago. As our freighter meanders beyond the downtown section, portions of the river maintain a distinctly old Miami feel. On the south bank, nestled in a stand of royal palms, are a row of perfectly restored quaint wooden cottages. The Miami River Inn was constructed just after the turn of the century in 1906. Its current owner, Sally Jude, restored the historic inn in the late 1980s. The inn serves as a reminder of a not so distant past, now almost lost in the center of a modern metropolis. I have some early pictures of the river with the uh, ladies and gentlemen on a Sunday afternoon with their hats on and their high collar shirts rowing on the river. If we care that our city has a history, it's like, does a person have a face? It's the face of our city that we're really keeping in place. Past the Miami River Inn, towards the center of the river, we get the distinct impression that this is not the United States. Without knowing it, we might have slipped past some international boundary into an unnamed Latin American country. Like a welcoming mother, the river and the city would open its arms to tens of thousands of exiles during the early 60s and beyond. Historian Paul George says Cuban Americans have been a dynamic ethnic group on the river. I think in many ways they helped to re-energize this body of water. I mean, and I think statistics bear that out. This is one of the busiest ports in the state of Florida today. It didn't get that way by accident. At Garcia's, you can drink in the ambience of the river the way it felt 40 years ago. This is a part of the old river where fishing boats still pull up to the docks and offload fresh catch. For Luis Garcia and his mother, the river means everything. My father first had a restaurant in Cuba, which survived basically on lunch. 
So when he came to America, he opened a restaurant with that same principle in mind, that we were only going to open till 6. She's the, really the, the reason why we're, we're, we're doing well. <laughs> she doesn't let me forget it. And she's very close to, look, the register. She, wa she wants to make sure that she's got her eye near the register. My dad first worked across the river there. He used to scale fish for national fisheries. And he always said, I'm going to have my own place. I'm going to have my own place. So I look at that all the time, and it kind of brings some per perspective. Tourism would be another great influence shaping the metropolis to come. And one of the early attractions started right here in the quaint riverside community called Spring Garden. In the late 1800s, a man named Warren B. Frazee opened an alligator farm near what is now Point Park in Spring Garden. A large man weighing some 270 pounds, Frazee would wrestle alligators for the enjoyment of early tourists and soon became known as Alligator Joe. In essence, Alligator Joe, as well as a man named Henry Coppinger, were the first real tourist attractions. Alligator Joe, as they called him, would wade into deep water and he'd get his alligator and he'd wrestle him and so forth and eventually bring him ashore. And that was good. But Henry Coppinger would go out with an Indian to paddle his canoe. He would dive off the canoe, get the alligator off the bottom, bring him up and bring him ashore. He's the one that learned to rub their tummies to put him into that comatose state. The Indians that later wrestled alligators at Musa Al learned from Henry Coppinger. This portion of the river is a microcosm of past, present, and future. For Ruth Greenfield, Spring Garden is a charming oasis in the heart of a teeming city. The story is that my grandparents came up here in about 1922 from Key West on the uh, Flagler Railroad. And uh, when they came here, I don't know how they found this place, but it was a little bit in the suburbs. You could go up on the porch and you could just look out, and there was the river. What I remember are the uh, Seminoles in the canoes coming and selling trinkets on the Miami River because their little colony was very close to here. Historian Patsy West interprets the social history of South Florida's Native Americans. I think the Miami River is a real focal point for the progress of the Seminole Miccosukee Indians. The on-the-job training that they got there in what we call today cultural tourism certainly benefited them almost all the way through the 20th century. Tourism that they learned on the Miami River at Musa Island Coppingers, you could say, is why they're successful today. Like the early Seminoles, there are longtime residents who feel almost a birthright to the river. Walter Ferguson proudly calls himself a river rat, a person he describes as one who's lived on the river for at least 50 years, or as he also puts it, 25 years if they've worked hard. There was a vessel named the Dixie, a two-decker, and the two-decker says, Jungle cruise right among the native Indians and alligators, the whole bit. And us kids, many times, would be here, we're going up and down the river, and the boat would arrive. And we used to laugh about it. A gentleman arrived in a V8 Ford automobile. He pulled off his business suit. He put on this Indian garb. 
he had one poor sick alligator out there, and I know they were friends, and he would go to work, and the alligator would make a snap or two at him, and this and that and the other, and people would go home saying, I was in Florida. I went so far up this river, and I saw wild Indians and alligators. And I wonder what happened to that poor old sick alligator. He was about as vicious as my kitty cat is at home. So take me back to a place where there's no traffic, no money to spend, no credit cards to lend. Gary Stone runs a nautical antique shop on South River Drive. He sometimes reflects on simpler times. When I was a little kid, probably eight or nine or ten, and we lived right next door to Musa Isle, we used to go over there and play with the Indians. Naturally, they were our friends. And they always wanted to be the cowboys and the white people always wanted to be the Indians. That was what we always wanted to do. We played cowboys and Indians, had a wonderful time. Two miles upstream into the heart of the inner city, we pass beneath the 12th Avenue Bridge and the mammoth hangars and dry docks of Merrill Stevens. America's entry into World War II would turn much of Miami into a training base. Many riverside shipyards would become factories for PT boats and other naval hardware. Fred Kirtland recalls the important role of Merrill Stevens Shipyard. Merrill Stevens in Miami took part in a number of government uh, operations. We earned the Army uh, Navy Honored E and uh, it, uh, we had a number of our employees that were off to war and came back. The River World War II was very important uh, because we had some very active boat yards uh, near the downtown area, especially on the uh, south bank of the river, uh, like the Miami Shipbuilding Company, who were making under government contract PT boats, PT-1s, PT-2s, aircraft rescue vessels, and uh, they were going on a 24-hour day basis. This portion in here was a huge machine shop. And every time the machinists made a mistake, they always threw the scrap parts, which were mostly brass, into the river. So when they clean this up, they're going to discover pure bronze. Until the war began, there were a lot of scrap metal yards up the river. And we were selling scrap metal that we would get from various places to whoever wanted to buy it. And one of the people that wanted to buy it was the Japanese. Right up to the attack on Pearl Harbor, we were shipping scrap metal to Japan. <laughs> Thousands of recruits would swell Miami's population, many returning after the war to settle and help build the city. All the way up the Miami River, you had various people that had started a business that were active in the repair of yachts. In any dry docking venture, the idea is to float the vessel over a platform, put the correct blocking underneath, you ground the keel, set the blocks, and then lift it up. During the early 60s and the Cold War, Merrill Stevens' Goliath hangars would launch ultra-secret CIA missions against Cuba. They wouldn't say, I'm with the CIA, but you kind of felt and you knew that some money was behind it and it was to assist these people and in getting various types of landing craft and boats that could be used in the Bay of Pigs invasion.
Passing beneath the 17th Avenue Bridge, the river opens to a scene out of a Tarzan movie. Royal palms thrust into the afternoon sky. What is now called Sewell Park had originally been a turn of the century homestead for one of Miami's early settlers. Here stand the remains of General Samuel C. Lawrence's estate. You can actually see the pillars are still here. The uh, floor is still preserved. Uh, so it's an interesting part of what was here uh, at that part of Miami's history. The Lawrence estate was part of an early river economy based on fishing, tourism, and agriculture. But during Prohibition, rum running from the Bahamas would become big business. The most famous of those rum runners was a man named Lou.